and welcome to another episode of Conversation with Sarah, hashtag conversation over coffee. On this episode, I am having next to me a person that I care very much about, a person that is so beautiful, so kind, so caring, so compassionate, as it is sadistic, mean, brutal. But that is what is visible on social media. And today, because this woman that I'm having the conversation over coffee with, I can guarantee you that will amaze you because she is amazing, not only as a professional, but also as a human, as a person. So, did I make you curious who it's my guest? Mm. See, I'm having next to me Mistress Tess. She is visiting Bucharest and I am fortunate enough to have her as my conversation over coffee partner. <laughs> so, hello, look. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for accepting my invitation. Oh, you're welcome. Pleasure. Thank you for allowing... I already know you, but... Yeah probably they don't know you as much as I know you so I think this is a huge privilege for them so in, on their names I'm thanking you. How are you doing? Yeah good, good. Happy to be back in Berlin. I know that you party a lot in Berlin. I'm very tired from Berlin, yes. How was that? Yeah, that was good. We, we originally planned just to come to me and Seven to uh, the summit. Um, but then we had a friend reach out and was like, come with us to Germany. I was like, oh, sounded like a good idea at the time. <laughs> it always sounds like a good idea. Yeah, it sounded like a good idea at the time. And no, I'm glad we are. We did both and it's very tiring. That's why you didn't, uh, you didn't see me Saturday night because I needed to rest. I was wondering yeah. where were you? Like... I didn't do the Saturday night in Berlin because I needed to, we had a very early flight. I was like, I'm going to be good. We're going to get an early night, pack and get, get home to Romania. So. Yeah. Did you have time? Do you, do you enjoy going to events? Um, yes and no. Uh, I think last week got re reminded me a little bit of sometimes why I don't like some of the events. I feel like even though they're sold as huge kink play parties, mm -hmm. they're not very kinky. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, what I were you expecting? I, 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 particularly at the Matrix Club, I was expecting there to be more like play scattered throughout the club, mm -hmm. rather than it all just be stuck in one little corner oh, where yeah. I saw yeah. you. Um, Kit Kat, and that's why I like Kit Kat because I feel like the Kit Kat event in Berlin is part of the German festival. Is it's so spread out, so you can turn around. There's someone here, there's someone over there, there's someone here. So it feels more like a kink event rather than just a nightclub with a. People just make it yeah, 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 right. yeah. So the main question of my interview is a very simple yet complicated from what I have <laughs> seen question, uh, and that is, who are you? Who am I? Wow. That's a very deep question. That's like simple but deep. You. I told you. <laughs> All the simple things usually yeah. are like So, difficult. yeah, oh, okay. Mm. Who am I? Oh, the first word that comes to mind is mother. It really does. That is just the first word that comes to my mind automatically because obviously I have children, two daughters and two stepdaughters. So mother is primarily who I am. Um, but then obviously to provide to be that mother, I am also a dominatrix. And then also to um, satisfy my soul as I've gone through this journey of a professional dominatrix is to become more of a lifestyle dominant, which I was still on the journey with from seven. So I guess it would be a, a bit a bit like I've put on my Twitter, mother dominatrix matriarch in <laughs> that order. And that's what I'm trying to bring balance to those three things, but I think that's probably what I would answer with who am I. Yeah. And how or what do you do to bring balance? Because it's not easy. No, it's not, and I'm finding out. <coughs> My voice is still feeling as sick as it, I sound sick still now. Is I'm still find, trying to find a balance where I work enough that I keep my health well, which means I can look after my children well, which means I then can have my hobbies and do those well, which is I'm always failing at still at the moment. If I'm honest, I have to 
I'll often work for six months and then I'll burn out. So it's got, I've definitely got to work on, I spoke to Seven recently about working on routine, scheduling, having a calendar, being very strict with my boundaries and strict with my time, which is something I'm still battling with. Nearly 10 years of doing this job is very difficult to fall into the trap of, oh, you know, mm. fly here, do this, work there, take this, and, and being very overworked very quickly before you know it. Yes, family is probably one of our yes. responsibilities yeah. and everything adds up. How do you cope with this? Like, do you have any, uh, I don't know, way of relaxing or recharging yourself? Horses. Okay. <laughs> the horses. So I have two horses now. I bought another horse eight weeks ago. Um, horses have always been for me to sit in the saddle and just ride, escape, concentrate on the animal underneath you. It's always been, I, I, it's a bit hard to explain. Even with meditation, I'm, I'm, I've tried, like, had a period of sleep last night when I woke up and I couldn't sleep and I tried counting sheep and I'm not counting the sheep. And I'm like, well, what color are the sheep? Are they white sheep? <laughs> Well, how high is the fence? Are they jumping a six foot fence? Is it a four foot fence? Is it a meadow? Are they on a highway? Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, even though I'm still going one, two, it's like a side brain of me that goes, all these questions. So, but when I'm in a saddle, none of, the, none, none of that happens. It's just me, horse, riding. So, you understand? It's, it's almost like disconnect a disconnect. Yes, it, disconnection. Right? That's mm -hmm. a good way. Yes, it's, it's a complete disconnect from work, from stress. From anything, but um, sometimes my brain will try and convince me not to ride because I've got so much to do. But then, as soon as I'm in the saddle, I don't regret riding. So it's definitely the horses my escape. How much time do you take for your pleasures and hobbies? Okay, that's another complicated question because <laughs> up until eight weeks ago, I only had one horse, and now I have two horses. So I'd say it's definitely four hours a day. Is with the horses. So we've now involved seven now helps with the horses. We've become, we've turned it into a, a family activity. Mm. So the children come and do the horses, seven helps with the horses, um, they muck out, they, they groom her, so they ride the, the, the younger one I've just bought and I ride my, my original horse. Oh, excuse me. And so um, we've made it more of a family activity. So it's not always as peaceful <laughs> as it is. Sometimes it is just me and that's and, and then sometimes it's a family. So yeah, I'd say three or four hours a day, easily. Because it's like maintenance and looking after them oh, as well. It's not just okay. the riding. So I would not know. I don't have that experience. <laughs> yes. I know only by far. I like to admire it, I okay, admire the resistance. <laughs> yeah, but never I tried yeah. once. It was okay for me, but here in Romania, we don't have. Mm, it's not such a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's quite. It's quite difficult if you have this. Uh, kind of yeah, I, I must admit, when we've been here on previous trips before, and we've had some downtime. I've gone to look because I've ridden in Mexico and I've ridden in um, Mauritius and I've ridden in uh, Spain and Croatia. So I, I, when we've been here before, you you can't find a tourist horse riding place in no, Rom Romania. Is not no. Right. Not riding, horsey. Kind of, <laughs> so let's go back to you. Uh, the next question is, who is the woman behind the image? The image of Mistress Tess? Yeah, see, when I get asked this a lot, because, and it's it's a confusing thing, because when I first started doing professional donation, I wanted to be called Mistress and my real name. Okay. And um, I had a couple of subs around me at the time that I'd been speaking to online who had been around for a very long time and we're like please don't like they were like i know what you want to do you want to be authentic you want it to be you and you don't want to have an alias and i understand that but you have a number of factors to consider when you're choosing this path is your you don't realize at the time when you're starting how much your privacy or your discretion is important not not just from a a separation point of view but from a from a safety point of view and also like the fact that obviously I have I had one daughter still at the time when I started so from protecting you know her childhood and her growing up and keeping that that space between you know raising a child and doing this job so at the beginning, very beginning I had to choose the alias and I always thought oh you know because I had men have tattoos in the past and they're like it's like Mistress Tessa's like 
and have her another name. So, and a uh, tattoo is very permanent. So, mm -hmm. I have had a conflict over the years with <clears throat> wanting to be as authentic as possible, but obviously hiding behind a name. And I just, I like to think that there isn't too much of a difference between the woman you see online, the woman you see in clips, and the woman that you see present on social media, apart from the fact that obviously everything that I'm doing with men is consensual play. Um, and I do in my relationship um, with seven do consensual play, but um, there is still a very empathic, I still try to project in my dominance uh, an empathic, down to earth, smiling, laughing persona, which is very much me, rather than trying to have this whole strict, complete alter ego, because I find I feel like I would find that very difficult for my mental health mm -hmm. to, to maintain an image right. that way. So I do try and be as authentic as possible, but obviously there are some degrees of separation for the reasons I told you, my children, you know, my safety, and things like that. But in terms of who it is behind, I wouldn't say that my real persona is very different to the persona I project online. Uh, is it difficult within this scene to be authentic? Um, I think I've come up against a lot of problems. Like I said to you, I do try and be as authentic as possible. I've come up a lot of, uh, uh, with a lot of problems in that because as being as authentic as you are, particularly, I remember there was one guy who came to me very early on saying how, about how real I've seen and how that was going to bite me in the ass as time went along. And I was like, mm, I don't know what you mean. Like, how could I be any other way than what I am? Right. And, I'm, and now, nine years later, I can see what he means because the problem with being authentic is that is all facets of a person. That's vulnerability, that's strength, that's so many different facets of a person is what it means to be authentic. You know, when you put on a persona and you put on an act, you can pretend to be strong all the time, and then, then that leaves that doesn't leave you so open to people to manipulate things against you. And I feel like uh, the problem being authentic in the scene, and it still doesn't deter me because I I don't feel like my like I said my mental health would do very well from being fake, but I do feel like that gives you. I mean, some certain people have ammunition sometimes to use against you for, um, and that's not just people in the scene, that's, that's people like authorities and different, um, like I've had troubles in the past or discussions with the people in England who look after childcare mm -hmm. and look after the welfare because children of your because job. of my job, um, and also um, and being authentic and speaking about what I do very openly. So I've had discrimination that way. So that's the word I'm trying to look for. Being very authentic sometimes can leave you open to discrimination outside of the scene, but also in the scene. I've had some subs who have got close to me and have been very authentic, and then when they've parted ways with me, they've used the information they've learned against me to cause me problems in, in my relationships, um, in, with, again, with authorities or with other uh, dominance on the scene, you know, mm -hmm. they've been trying to pass on that information and to weaponize it. Do you understand? Right. Right. So yeah, I think I think sometimes it can be a bit of a struggle to be authentic in, in, the, in the professional sense because um, it leaves you vulnerable to people using that information against you. You just mentioned discrimination, and I think that's a very uh, actual and uh, important uh, topic I've experienced myself. But well, would you like to give more details, especially oh, from? I'm just gonna get my list. <laughs> <laughs> because probably people yeah. out there they don't understand what it is, and when we are referring to discrimination, they they barely understand what we are referring to. Yeah. So being so, a dominatrix in our society is not an easy thing. 100% no. So if we're talking about societal discrimination, I've been denied bank accounts. So certain companies, because um, I, the bank account I have now is a bank account I've had since I was a child. Mm -hmm. And I kept that. And, but when I wanted to convert my business from a uh, self, I'm still self-employed at the moment, when I looked into the avenue of converting in England, I don't know if it's the same here in Romania, you can be one person or you can become a company. Yeah. So I looked at becoming a company, but you need to have a business bank account. Now to obtain a business bank account in the UK, you have to have an interview and they have to, you have to prove what you do. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I proved I was in the adult industry, I was denied bank accounts from two different very well-known English bank, uh, bank providers. 
So that's one place. And um, also insurance companies. I've been denied insurance, contents insurance, because, because, because of what I do in the, in the type of business. Um, and also, um, and like I said, I've had a couple of conversations in the past with child services in the UK. When I lived in one area of the country, they were very understanding. Um, they, they spoke to me about a report that they had and, and they were very nice. And then I moved and I dealt with a different area of the country. And there was a woman, I'm not a man, and the woman was making me feel bad about things that the previous area had made me feel like, no, you can do that, you're doing everything perfectly legal. Like, for example, if I was wanting to have equipment in the house, as long as it was stored in a locked place so the children could access it, that was fine. And then I speak to another authority, and the same authority in a different area, who was making me feel like um, I was doing wrong by using my children keeping the equipment in the house, despite the fact it was locked. So. Just that type of discrimination from a, you know, in dis disparity in different areas of the country, but being the same uh, governing body, you know? Mm. So, yeah, so quite different a few areas, really. And then obviously, socially, like I said, trying to protect my identity, my real identity from the parents of the teenager I'm raising, because I don't want her treated in a different way. And on the odd occasion, the other people have found out they have taken their um, children no longer allowed to come to the house you know understand mm -hmm. so I have to be very careful keeping that because then there's the societal discrimination not of other women not understanding what it is that we do and the fact that it's consensual and um, and and we, I guess feeling threatened if you will so. I always uh, I always say in order to understand BSM and uh, femdom in general, or everything that is related to this area, you need to have a certain level of education yes. and then um, IQ. Yes. Because you can't understand, yes. and sometimes it happens that the, the uh, governmental uh, institutions are not the smartest. No. To just no. put it out that way. So, no. yeah. I, I said what I said. So. <laughs> That's, We're not that's, that's, any that's, country, that's so the yeah. reality, you know, <laughs> yeah, the moment yeah, yeah. that they hear what your business is, they just completely yeah. change the attitude, change the, the way that they interact with you, and yeah. in a way they try to minimize you, mm -hmm. and try to yeah. make you feel ashamed of what you're doing, yeah, exactly. even though I, so. I, from my perspective, we are helping people, we yes. are uh, one side dominant, uh, and statistic and mean and stuff but at the same time we are healing yes we are using talking healing, healing hearing people exactly. yes yeah because often it happens that um people are not being heard no and that's one of the biggest things like the guys like obviously <coughs> There, it's like, I, I can't talk to my friends about this, I can't talk to a therapist about this because mm -hmm. there's no support that way in particularly the UK. Canada and the US is a bit different and here, <laughs> even worse. But, and you, you're the only one I can open up about and even just voicing yeah. their inclinations make them feel more peaceful, you know? So, guys, yeah, it's 100% good. I, I had, uh, I had uh, one of my submissives, he wanted to try some sort of a therapy because he was struggling with some uh, insecurities and uh, again from the society yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way people and he are, went yeah. to a therapist and the therapist sent him to a church yeah so that was the solution yeah you know? yeah no my my, my it's amazing and for bsm but one of my my father i sent my father for therapy about 10 years ago to um uh he had a drug problem he had to be hooked on marijuana and um he uh they sent, I sent her to a hypnosis, and in the end, she was trying to do the hypnosis and to church. And it's oh, crazy, wow. yeah, crazy. So I think I can understand, like, when these people go to the, and they feel like they're being manipulated in a different way to mm -hmm. when they really just want to be heard and understood, I think is, is the appropriate way to say it, but there's just not a lot of that around, so. What's your, what's your family's perspective about uh, I'm sorry. your life? I've always been very open with my parents about what I do. I mean, to have my entire family at this point know what I do. <coughs> um, I think they know that I'm very strong-willed. <laughs> I want to do exactly what I want to do, no matter what they think. So I've always been very honest. And they've been very supportive. I mean, over the years, as you know, back in 2019, when I had the break-in, 
Um, my dad came to clean dungeon equipment and my mother was scrubbing walls and they were both in there. And to this day, my father doesn't want to know details, obviously, mm -hmm. is my dad, but um, my mother is coming to my parties and telling both, like, oh, the, wow. Yeah, the last <laughs> vanilla corruption party, she's brought friends with her and she's talking about how proud she is. So they're very, very supportive, very proud. Um, um, I've had a couple of people in the family at, at times who have been a bit loud with their opinion, but my, on the whole now, after nearly a decade of doing this, I have no issues. With How do you support you with your mom? Uh, <laughs> you can with your mom. <laughs> so she used to, she used to be a lot more involved actually, like when she first, because she came to my very first in an corruption party in 2016, and um, she was paddling and whipping and, Go on. and now she's <laughs> now she's more reserved watching to, she brings a few friends and they watch as well but it's, it's, it doesn't feel alien or anything it doesn't feel i'm glad that she's broadening her understanding mm -hmm. you know because sometimes she still doesn't understand like for example um we had a vanilla corruption party a couple of years ago where a goddess serena was having me and got lucky goddess and she had done a bondage scene where this guy was very tightly wound with rope and his hands were rope and she was sat with him and his hands were going purple mm -hmm. but she's here connecting checking with him as you do as a professional and my mother came over and was like you, you need to untie him you've been too mean and he's got his hands and she couldn't understand like do you know mm -hmm. and i'm like mom you can't just come in to a scene like that and Say these. You're ruining the moment. Yeah, you're ruining the moment. Like, yeah, you know, so she still doesn't quite understand the dynamics. Mm -hmm. like, she, she's accepting, but I don't think, like you were saying, between me and my mum's, she's a doer. Mm -hmm. She's not a, yeah. it's not her IQ. It's, it's not. a different generation. She, she is. She's a cook, clean mother mm -hmm. rather than, you know, she doesn't use the computers. She doesn't really read a lot of books. It's, she's does things with her hands rather than with her with her, with her mind. So I think it's more of a she can understand and be accepting that that's how people want to live their lives. But in terms of trying to get her mind around a dynamic, is complicated. Mm -hmm. so. How it is this for you, for the the woman, to be a mom within this thing? Yeah, do you think it has any positive aspect? Um, I think, so. your, your I think so because obviously my, my, my teenager is 14 and a half now and I don't think I heard my mum say the word orgasm at all in my teen years, not once. Whereas now with my daughter who's now experimenting a little bit more on alcohol and talking more about like drugs and smoking things she's hearing at school um, and I can feel like she can be very open with these conversations, it has led on to conversations about sex. So I have been very open about, you know, should she want to, and obviously she started a period this year, so it's like talking to her about contraceptives, talking to her about being very open about sex and vibrators, and does she, when she feels ready to talk to me about these things, she can approach me, so I feel like it does give you a degree of openness. Um, but there is obviously still, I'm still to come out the back end of that to see what it's going to be truly like when she finds out exactly what it is I do for work and how she responds to that. But it, I, I like to think over the years there's been so many little subtleties that indicate what I do in a normal way rather than a, you know, like a shocking, you know, like we were saying earlier about it from the outside it may look like I'm beating and hurting people. I like to think there's been a few things where she's learned more about consent from me and having, I've had a few house slaves in the past where she's been there, obviously completely vanilla clothes mm -hmm. and everything, but they've been around so the, the fact that men are helpful is a normal thing. Do you know what I mean? There's, yeah. there's small subtleties that I think are going to build up to hopefully make it less of a, a shocking revelation when she does actually find out. But, um, and still some years off. Probably, <laughs> probably helping her to understand what mm. actual feminism is. Yes, yes, yes. It's about women and men yes. having their own role. Yes. Um, tell me about Tess as a child. Oh. How were you as a child? <laughs> a boy. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> not I was a boy. Yes, now I played for a football team until I was. I played for the city's football team till I was around 13. I had a short haircut, I wore only trousers. I didn't wear makeup till I was 
18, I think, or have healed until I was 18, which is, I think some people were shocked by, considering I have nothing but shoes now. How many pairs of shoes? Um, she has an impressive collection. I do. <laughs> you did not hear that. <laughs> but yeah, so there is space for more. Yeah, there is always space for more. <laughs> no, I was a tomboy. Motorcycles, stripping engines, spending time with boys all the time. I had very few girlfriends. Um, I probably had one, two girlfriends in my teenage years. Um, the, I had a couple of friends, boys that ended up being bisexual in the end, actually. I don't know if that kind of gravitates those sort of personalities because mm -hmm. of their openness. Um, but um, you could tell when we were in school that they were going to go that way and then by the way that they acted and, and spoke. But um, yeah, I was very tomboyish, um, not at all like you see now. In fact, I show people pictures and they're like, that doesn't even look like you. <laughs> but yeah, um, I spent a lot of time doing boy activities. I did my first job was an engineer, so I, was, I, I did engineering, I did my... Uh, work experience at school as a mechanic, so um, everything was boy stuff, or well, typically masculine Did stuff, shall I say. any official job, a vanilla official job? Oh, I've, always worked, always. I've always worked um, since a very young age. Um, my mom, that's another thing my mum was bragging about, vanilla corruption, right in my work ethic. Um, my first vanilla job, I was 13, I had three jobs. I was a paper, I did a paper round. Uh, I also worked as a waitress in a pub, which was highly illegal, but it still <laughs> happened. Um, and I also did um, uh, a, a, a after school job at a, a horse livery, looking after horses. So, um, but my first professional uh, vanilla job was yes, I did a mechanical engineering degree, so I worked at an engineering firm for eight years, up until the recession, you remember the recession? <laughs> So I worked from yeah, 2002 to 2009, yeah, I, I worked doing engineering, I was a mechanical engineer, so I did maintenance engineering, so I looked after the machines that um, built the engines, basically. Mm -hmm. So you started working from quite a 16. early age. Yeah, 16. Uh, why did you start it so did you have to or it was your own choice? I, I always want things. <laughs> okay. I want things. So uh, a, a young girl, I wanted a motorbike. I wanted to go with the boys down on, in the brick pits riding motorbikes. So I needed to find money for a motorbike. My, my father went bankrupt when I was nine. So we didn't have anything for a really long time, or not a lot for a really long time. I'm talking like my mother would shop in charity shops and you know we really from from about the age of nine to my mid-teens we weren't very we as a family we didn't have a lot of money so i had to find ways to make my own money mm -hmm. so um, that was always a driving factor for me i always had a good work ethic, work ethic if i see something that i want i think well how can i get it what can i do what can i do to get it so um so that was the driving factor for the really young age to get the engineering job at 16 was the, 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 I guess the motivation for that was if you went into a job like that that early, they fully cover in England and there's certain other companies that do it, not just engineering, certain other industri industries that do this as well. They'll fully cover your edu further education within that role, so that's the, that's the motivation for going young into those sort of jobs. But yeah, I've always been a worker. Always. Can you say that your other uh, bankruptcy experience and the fact that it probably was for your uh, family a difficult period of time impacted in the way that you are seeing life now and uh, um, your passion for shoes, can it be linked to that? I don't know, no, if I, okay, so that's a couple of things there. The bankruptcy thing, I, I think I've always, I think I think that might have encouraged my work ethic, but you could say then why is my sister not like <laughs> My sister is very entitled. No sisters are like this. <laughs> like, no. Yeah, no. my sister is very much I expect people to give her things. And I have men give me things in this job, I know, but what I mean is I still have built a reputation and I still work hard for the things I'm given or gifted or earned. My sister has a very entitled attitude where she expects to be do nothing, be, mm -hmm. be given something. So, and she went through the same thing as I did, obviously a bit younger. <clears throat> She's three years younger than me. But she didn't come out with the same work ethic I did. 
So no, I can't, I can't no, say no, that they don't. No, right? no. The small ones are the ones that yeah. are a bit brattish and yeah. the firstborn are more precious. Yeah. She's definitely a lot more precious than I am. Um, with my with the shoes, if I'm hundred percent on, how did it all start? Yeah, if I'm, if I'm done, if you remember the first pair, I do the remember the first pair, and I can tell you exactly. But I'm not exactly proud of how it came around. I did wear shoes. So when I was working. And before I split up with my teenager's um, father, my first husband, I had an affair and I fell in love with the man I had the affair with and I wanted to leave my husband for the man I had the affair with but he, in the end, he was older than me, quite considerably older than me and decided that um, it was very clear over a period of time that he was never going to leave his wife and so I guess for a period of time I wanted to try and be his wife mm -hmm. and she had a large red sock collection okay so it was that is definitely where it started for me i wanted to have the collection she had mm -hmm. because and the clothes that she had and the lifestyle that they had so then maybe because i was in a, it was a bad time for me i was in my mid-20s i was very young very naive wasn't the woman you see now and i guess i i, I, I felt very I, I need that, I that, guess. The early 20s are the, the period where you are still, still we are as are an adult. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. What's so the that's where definitely where it started. And I remember my first pair, <coughs> I saved and saved and saved for it. And it was um, it was a pair of black daffodils. I have them, I don't have, they're not the same pair, but I have them again now. Mm -hmm. I went out and bought them again. But um, I saved and saved and went to London and bought myself a pair. And um, I remember it very vividly going to Selfridges and buying them. So it's not a proud way of doing it, but that is exactly where they came from. But I've just had it's been. I guess this this job also encourages um, that kind of um, uh, gluttony, if you will, mm -hmm. and it has become a little bit of a brand for me. So, and women always like, oh, how do you get so many pairs? I'm like, because I never accept anything less. If you if you set yourself a standard and you only accept that standard, you're always going to attract that standard. So that's how I've ended up with so many pairs. So if you want to be happy, <laughs> bring the Louboutins. Bring the Louboutins, <laughs> yeah, every time. People are like, what do you want for Christmas? Well, duh. So it's easy, <laughs> I know you for several years already, um, and I don't think I've seen you without any Louboutins. <laughs> no. Always. Always wearing them. Yes, they're my favourite. Even if it's just sneakers now as well, I've got quite a lot of their flat shoes, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, they are my favourite brand. They're not the most comfortable. Not all, but... no, not all. This is a Bagel, this is quite a comfortable shoe, but there are some terrible. But I call them two hour shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, I mean, it's, one yeah. is like a photo shoe. Yeah, sit down shoes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's quite a lot of pairs that are sit-down shoes, but yes, you are. There are some. There are some nice ones. In fact, I've just acquired second-hand. They should be there when I get home. Their 20th anniversary. Um, do, you, do you remember them? Fans on Gala in Athens. Yeah. Their tangent was wearing them. Mm -hmm. They were like the straps with the yeah. spikes. Yeah. Oh, yes, I have found a pair second-hand, and I'm there will be there when I get home. I've wanted a pair since ever since I started collecting. So. 10 years, 12 years, and I finally got the pair that I've dreamt of. So I was like, right, that is so. So I was like, right, are you finished? No, I'm not finished. No, <laughs> you can't, you can't. When it comes down I'm not finished. You're yeah. never done. You can't. Yes. Uh, like, like we said, <laughs> there's always space yes. for more. If you, if there's no space, you create space. So <laughs> it's not a shoe problem, it's a storage yeah. problem. Yeah, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Then you have to change the house. Because yes, it's more just get a bigger yeah. house. And so when you buy me the bigger house, it'll be great. So <laughs> let's talk a bit, you just mentioned about your love life. Mm -hmm. When did you have your first boyfriend? Oh, okay, so like I said, was a bit of a tomboy. Wasn't really interested in boys very much early, early on. Were you that that kid <sighs> like kissing a, girl, a boy like, ew? Um, yeah, I was more interested in spending time with boys than okay. kissing boys. And then the first boyfriend I had was a lot older because um, how old was he? At twenty five, and I was fifteen. Okay, very much older. Um, because I met him doing the motorbikes and spending time with older men or older boys, and and met him. Mm -hmm. He was a man. Um, and spending time with the motorbikes, and that's how I met him. So he was ten years older than me. And the boyfriend I had after that, when I was seventeen, was again ten years older than me. 
but I, majority of the men that I've been with over the years have always been older than me. And some people have said, oh, it's because you've got daddy issues. But me and my dad have a really nice relationship. I think we have a great relationship. I think it is, exactly. Because me and my father have a great relationship. It's just, I think it's always been for me a level of maturity, a maturity right. thing. Like I was, I had no time for young men. I tried dating one young man in between um, leaving my daughter's father and um, meeting my second husband. And um, like about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, but he, um, it was like dating a puppy. It was horrible. Like he was like, he was only five years younger than me, but it was honestly, it was like I can't describe it any other way. It was like dating a puppy. And I was like, no, never again. Always been older men for me. So yeah, my first boyfriend was, I was 15, nearly 16, so quite late. It's not like I had boyfriends through school, really. Not, I was never really interested. And how was that relationship? What, which one? Uh, your first relationship. My first one. Um, a bit difficult because, um, like I said, I, th I think if I analyse it as a whole, it would be a maturity thing. But I think with him, it was, it was, uh, he had the motorbike and the leather jacket and he looked cool and I wanted to be the one who was with the guy with the leather jacket and the motorbike. So it was more an, an image thing and then actually when I got to know him, it was actually very um, distant with his mother and was, you know, very mature oh. and it, it wasn't it wasn't great, but it did teach me a few things like... Um, what was the most important? Uh, consent is <laughs> well, probably where it started with that because um, we had some challenges. Um, I won't go too deep on, on, on an interview like this, but um, I I felt obligated to have sex with him as and when. I lived in my first relationship. My mother didn't talk to me about sex or anything like that. And I didn't consider the damage that I was doing at the time until I went for therapy years after. And the therapist was like, you know, if you aren't saying yes, despite your relationship, that's still a breach of your consent. So. It wasn't during the relationship, I'd obviously learned that, but obviously from that relationship, I learned very early on through a therapist about, you know, what is consensual, despite the fact, it's like, it's like when you um, have, it, with sessions now, you may have a client you've seen for years and years and years, but it's still very important to regularly speak about yeah. consent. You know, have things changed for you? I make my men and myself do an end of year review. If I see them, because the ones I see the most, even then, are only once a month, really, in England. So, you know, at the end of the year, I sit them down and I say, right, what have you enjoyed? What do you want to do less of? What do you want to do more of? And in fact, every now and again, we encourage them to still send the um, post-session review, mm -hmm. post-time yeah. together review on email. Not all of them will sit down and do it, they're just lazy. But if they don't, it's the end of the year review, talking about what they like, what they don't like. So I guess it was, it was for me, learning consent is an ongoing thing. It's not just... You get into a relationship, you have an expectation, you're, you're supposed to follow through that expectation, things change. Right. So that was the biggest thing I took away from that relationship, really. That's an important um, thing to mention. I often try to raise the awareness about the fact that no is a complete sentence. Yeah. And if someone has an issue with you saying no and trying to push you or trying to mm. even change your mind just a little bit, that that thing is not okay and it shall not be accepted. So, um, how important do you think is knowing yourself when it, it comes down to interacting with people as as a woman, or with men as a woman? So you mean like how we speak self assured? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I think that's also another difficult thing in this job is is self-assurance because we're always supposed to do <laughs> somebody said to me once well, all dominatrixes are narcissists <laughs> yeah. because you're always supposed to be oh and don't get me wrong I'm sure there's a huge degree that actually really are I've been accused of being one myself in the past by certain individuals but I feel like you have to always portray a uh, obviously particularly as a professional because nobody's going to want to go to the dominatrix that goes oh well, you know, I don't really know if I'm good at this or I'm not very good at that. But you could try. Nobody's going to go for that person. Okay, but he's no sane safety. person. Exactly. It's not just safety. It's not attractive. There's, there's the safety. There's the attractiveness. Are they going to know about consent? So there's so many elements of that. So people do say that 
we self portray as narcissists, and it's kind of right because narcissists have an ego, and you do have to you you have to love and enjoy and be very assured in yourself in this job. And I do think it's very important. It's much more. It's much more than just that. Front. Just yeah. to be a narcissist. Oh, of the course. The gaslighting, the manipulation, of course. Of course. the triangulation. There, there's a lot of. Of course, things. of course, and uh, and I realise that, but um. There are certain people who obviously have said that, you know, it all comes mm. up, but that's just the, that's just the frustration. The yeah, 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 yeah. And it's also just a front, it's just a 2D view, isn't it? Like you said, narcissists are more, there's so much more behind a narcissist mm. than just being egotistical and loving themselves. So, yeah, but so for being so mature in this job, it, is, it can be a challenge sometimes as well, because there's so much out there that can, or well, so many people ready to shoot you down and make you feel like you're not doing a good job or you're not, you're not doing something that's right. Give me an example of an experience like this that you had to face. Oh. And how did you cope with it? Because I'm pretty sure there are ladies out there that are seeing or even um, vanilla or within the scene that have faced this. Yeah. And it might be helpful. You're not the only one yeah. that's facing it. Yeah. Um, Something that just jumped to mind, I guess it's not really an example of play that I've done and people are, um, people have come to me about it, but um, I do a CBT workshop now, it's like a workshop for ladies to learn comfortable torture. And I know a lot of ladies, they come to the workshop and they're really surprised about how easy some things are, particularly things like needle play. And it's like, because they see people doing it online and they want to do it, but they don't know how to do it right. And then they don't want to be judged for doing it wrong. But then they, when they see me do it, they see how easy it is. And I had there have been occasions where I've done things and people have been like, well, you can't do it like that, that that's wrong. Or this is, so, so for example, I have put needles right the way through body parts unnecessarily. Some people would be a bit like, whoa, hang on a minute. That goes beyond the realms of, um, uh, you know, just a surface scratch or a surface, like needle was usually surface. But I've had in length behind the scenes discussions with my sub at the time about how we play, safe, safe, consensual, what the risks are, aftercare. And that's like in the CBT workshop, I said, it's not just learning how to do things, it's learning how to discuss consent, mm -hmm. knowing how to prep the scene, knowing how to play safely. And even if you're going to take it beyond more of a surface play or something a little bit more extreme, is knowing what the risks are, are involved as you go deeper into that play. So I guess it's just being, like you said, it comes down to a self-assurance thing because it doesn't matter what you put on social media, people are still going to make their decisions. Yeah. And, as, and to, as, to, as to how to advise women how to handle that would be, if you have, feel confident that you have had the discussions about, like I said, the consent, the aftercare, and checking in on yourself, and you've done everything you possibly feel you can do, and you've educated and invested in, in your education mm -hmm. in what you're doing. Because I feel like this job is a constant evolving process yeah. of learning all the time, From investing in yourself, you, invest, investing in your education in this job. And I know it can be difficult, there's so many people not willing to share knowledge, but there's, we're, we're, we're becoming more, like this summit, mm -hmm. there's becoming more and more opportunities to meet, network, learn, and invest in yourself. So I feel like if you can, feel confident you've done everything you can and you've had all the relevant conversations. You just need to stand your ground when it comes to, particularly when it comes to the social media element. But it does come back to what you're saying about being self-assured. Mm -hmm. You've done the best you can. And so, yeah, I, like, I guess that's... That links for a bit with being authentic also. Yes. Yeah. Not just having an image. To build an image is so very... Yeah, because you see these... I don't know if you saw it a while ago. That young lady it. going around on Twitter where she lit that guy on fire. Yeah. Did you see that? And yeah. it's like, it, it, it seems like... It, there's a lot of women who are falling into that trap of going one step further just to make a, a click, a like, an impression yeah. online, and it just becomes so easy to, to yeah, yeah, and that's not authentic. Because if you're doing things just to make yourself look good online, then that's somewhere where you've got a question. This is not. From where did you not, get all your knowledges? I mean. Um. So I, I when I started doing this, um, yeah. I read a lot of blogs and books that I found online, but most of those were written by American ladies and American doms. And a lot of those said about finding a woman to apprentice with. So when I went off trying to find one in the UK back in 2014, um, 
there wasn't very many willing to help me. There was, um, well, still is very difficult sometimes to find education in the UK. But back then it was like, no, no, no. It wasn't until Nikki Whiplash at Dominatrix in Hampshire invited me along to be filming with her where I learned what to do during the scene in the, on the content day was paid and obviously got to have behind the scenes conversations with her and learn that way. So I started off there and then the association with her very early on gave me a lot of connections very quickly with other people, I guess on her level, the peers on that level at the time. So that really did help me on very, very a lot early on, but, in, but I've not been, it's not been unknown for me to attend workshops, online classes, Domino Snow stuff, um, go to retreats, attend summits, you know, go to things like the gala, other other events where um, I've sent, and also things for seven, I've sent seven on classes, latex workshops to learn how to repair latex. Um, so, you know, it's definitely always trying to find and invest. If I want to learn something, where can I learn it? How can I learn it? And, and trying to find somewhere to learn, really. Let's talk a bit about your actual um, relationship, your partner. How did you guys meet? <laughs> so I don't think that's a secret. Um, he came to me in 2019 as a filming slave. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a connection very quickly. And then about six or seven months after that, after being Dom and slave for a while, we, we got together um, on the night of Club Pedestal. Okay. <laughs> Do you still remember what was your first impression when you saw it? Um, a very soft vulnerability about him. Uh, a genuine, oh, it's hard to describe, people always say this is very hard to describe. Uh, I just wanted to gather him up. Mm -hmm. And I, that was the, the biggest feeling I remember from that time. And what was it for you? <laughs> Do you remember what was your first impression when you lay your eyes on her? That's <laughs> really uh, uh, my memory. Not so <laughs> it's not a good memory. Um, no. but, this is the reason for one month. <laughs> 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 I just remember seeing this, um, this very attractive woman appear on the scene. Um, I was filming with, with others at the time. I uh, saw that she was looking for people to film with, um, so I dropped her an email. Um, and a little bit later, we ended up filming together, and she was um, not just the person that I'd seen online visually, um, but a, a very warm individual that was full of energy. And, personality and, and that's kind of what made me um, form a connection with her in the, in the first instance. Who asked out the first? Me. You? Okay. <laughs> what was the, what, what the said? Describe me the first day. I just kissed him. <laughs> yeah, no, we, and I also wanted to kind of interject there and say like, I was probably about like a thousand filmmakers like watching this and thinking, Oh shit, that's how it's done. That is not how it's done. <laughs> that, Don't get the idea. That's just it's like... one in five million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one in five million. Because people are like, you have, oh, there is hope. There is not hope for you. <laughs> um, but you know, um, obviously I knew we had a connection that we had. And we'd been to, um, I took him with me to you know, Zara's seminar summer camp at Portugal. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and we had a moment there, so I knew there was something between us. And uh, he was driving me the pedestal, and um, I, I guess I could just feel it. I just kissed him. <laughs> so it just went from there. It wasn't really a date. It kind of just went straight from mistress slave to uh, me being on his face. <laughs> Did you ever have any doubts relating uh, related to his genuinity because it often happens that men try to get near us because of the image and because of what we do because of what we represent so yeah. sometimes that that's a risk yeah i, I understand what you're saying are you worried that they, that they just didn't want just wanted to dominate you yeah. and they're not the person behind no because we spent a lot we did also spend a lot of service play not non-play time together like he would accompany me places, and I know there was a particular time, or a couple of times, during the period that 
up until a week when I kissed him that I got sick. Mm -hmm. I really like it. I, I get uh, quite, quite cold and I'm quite off again. I'm just recovering now from a chest infection or a sinus infection. Then we got particularly quite ill just before we got together and he came to sit by my bedside. So it was more like I had that impression from him that it was, it was deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It was deep, deeper than just the, the dominatrix. Because I know what you're saying, there's a lot of men that they perhaps just want the latex cat suit and they win the other time, but no, it wasn't about that. It wasn't just the felt, idea of feeling the dawn. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. No, he didn't feel like that from him. He was, he was there in times that were way beyond like me being sick and, you know, having me do the food shopping and, you know, not, not just like, so, I mean, walking around with me, you know, mm -hmm. doing things that would ordinarily a couple would do. So, it was. When did you fall in love with, with him? Oh. Um, I don't well, know. Like I said, when did you realize that you loved him? It had to be when we came back from the summer camp, because which was about five months in, because of the way that I felt it, on the trip. And then when I, when I came home, like I said, and I was sick, and he ran to my bedside, and I remember waking up, and he was just sat at the end of the bed rubbing my feet and I was I didn't even know he'd come in the house. I was so ill and he was looking after me and I remember thinking, oh shit, I'm falling in love with this guy. So I remember it, it must have been yeah, about a month before we actually got together. What about you? <laughs> How was in your case? I, I don't think it's possible to pinpoint it really. I think it was a, a, a journey that I went on to, um, to, to get to a space where Expected it to happen. It's not something I was looking for. We were both um, married. Okay. <laughs> okay. Complicated situation. Yeah. Uh, so neither of us was looking for it. No, we just um, happened upon each other, um, arguably at the right time. Our paths uh, having crossed previously. Four years. Um, over four years, we've been at the same events, mm -hmm. concerts, music concerts racing days, we were in the same place at the same time for over several years, never met. I personally have a belief that things happen in the right moment, when we are when we're ready supposed to, to ready, when we're supposed and to nothing happens yes. like this. Yes, yes. So yeah, looking back over a period of four years, we were in the same place a lot, but never met. Yeah. Outside of the king scene, <laughs> so that's the interesting thing. All the play, all the vanilla places we were at at the same time, but never met. Wow! Us. So, wow! Yes. So you should write a book about it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it will be the next uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do in this? Little bit of work, free time that you have. So aside from the horses, oh, not a lot, because not a lot of time. I do like reading. I brought a book with me to this this trip to read some, because I do like reading and I would love to have more time to read. Um, and also, um, uh, I'm very crafty, art crafty, and a cooking. Like tonight I'm in mean, from scratch with carbonara. So I, I do like cooking, I like reading. I also like um, being very crafty, and me and the girls quite often sit down and do photo frames where we're gluing things to things, or painting, or we go pottery paint, I take the girls pottery painting, and I made a, a tea tray for my next event, actually, for the tea party for my next event, I made a guy on a cute tea tray, so I do like doing crafty stuff as well, but it's very rare. <laughs> What's your favourite activity as a couple? Oh, we don't have Do you have <laughs> <laughs> It's now the horse, isn't it, really, I guess? We don't have time to do anything else together, do we? <laughs> Outside of the companion mind, it works for me. So we're, we're together all the time for work. Mm -hmm. Again, it is very busy. So outside of raising the kids and working, it, the only thing we do do together, which we probably should work more on, is, is, is the horse. Yeah. I really would like to go dancing. We occasionally go to the gym together, which we've enjoyed. Who is a better dancer? Oh, it's which definitely one? not him. <laughs> <laughs> Men never he has are. square hips. <laughs> Men have square hips. <laughs> so what, what is the thing that you do not like about him? Because you, nobody is perfect. Oh, he's a bad communicator. <laughs> okay. He's a bad communicator. <laughs> he's, 
it is not very good at uh, I don't know if it's a man thing or whether it's currently working out but I, I don't know if you've seen it online we will go through a process of our toddler being autistic mm -hmm. and I believe that the seven does show a lot of the traits of autism and I believe that we're coming to a, through a process now of we're working out where it's not necessarily that he's bad at communicating that his brain doesn't work mm -hmm. the same way as mine so we're now trying to find the common ground of communicating that because he, he has certain needs how he communicates I have certain needs how I communicate and they're very different so we, we are currently Do trying to find the path techniques? no that's what we're trying to work out we're going to do the process now trying to work that out almost like um uh, like a, I think when I was talking to a friend about what they do when she does with her partner is they ask each other how, how they are on a scale of 1 to 10 mm -hmm. in situations and maybe we're not doing techniques like that but I'd say the communication is one thing but we definitely do need to find a better way of doing because uh, I'm, I'm coming to the realisation that it's not because he's a man it's not necessarily because he just doesn't want to it's just that his brain works different to mine mm -hmm. so. and what about you what do you feel that's like? I suppose it, it's, it's pretty much on the same the, the, the same wavelength. Um, I'm very much a my, my brain works in a very focused, targeted way. I'll just go on and do things without necessarily communicating them them back. I'll just think of something to do and I'll go off and I'll and do it. Whereas, whereas I talk about everything. Whereas, <laughs> yeah, whether you're a Gemini, we we'll talk yeah, about everything. Talk everything. We talk. Uh, talk, talk, talk. <laughs> talk yeah. and think. So, when when I, find, I find it very hard that he knows everything about me my whole life. I never spend a lot of time together anyway, but when we're not together my whole day, I'll, you know, it's, whereas he'll, I'll, I'll find out in two weeks that uh, something's happened in his family and then that I don't know about it. So someone else mentions it and it's like, he just doesn't think, you know, go through his day and get on and, yeah. So that's what we're trying to work out between us. What is the most important thing that you have learned, practicing with SM and uh, having the matriarchal lifestyle? And I, when I'm asking this, I want to refer to the test that it was before and the test that is now. Oh. The one that it is. Is there any change? You think you're more of a lifestyle, right? Um, I don't think so. Not not any change per se. But I would I would I would like to also think that it's for example when we come here, usually when we come here obviously we stay with Zada at the house of sin and watching her lifestyle and how it portrays online is that she's doing this easy and this easy and this easy and it's she's the matriarch and everything how is she balancing that around children blah 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 we've got kids and we're finding really hard all the time to make balance well and, you have four and, and, no, I know I know I've only two of them at home most of the time but um and you know she makes it look seamless but then when we come here we watch how hard how much hard work she puts into her lifestyle and how it is Realistically, as somebody said to me the other day, what, what she's cracked is she's monetized her lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm not monetizing my lifestyle, I'm running a professional you dog. Well, I don't feel like it's as, as easy for me because we have children with shared relationships, so I can't just like um, bring it into my house mm -hmm. as much as she does in terms of, um, you know, have to sit and food all around and stuff like that. I couldn't just do that. His ex wife would allow it, my ex husband has already had a problem with it in the past. So, um, so there is that element of it, but um, she's, she's, I'm, so I'm not running the similar sort of setup. She's managed to monetize her lifestyle, and it's a massive, admirable thing. Whereas I'm running a professional lifestyle, uh, professional job, and then a dominatrix job, and then also trying to be a lifestyle dominant on the side. And sometimes the switch is very different. Mm -hmm. And and I know that when we are together, after being parents for so long, and you know, in work mode for so long, and we come away like this. It'll take a little while for us to decompress and get into a situation where we can operate more of an authentic mm -hmm. FLR because it's so different. It's, it's not easy to work that in our lifestyles at home. There are small things that help us, like rituals. Kiss kids my feet every morning and night. And when I'm away on tour, who wear chastity, but those are very small things. I'm talking about like building a very atmospheric 
FLR every day, it takes us a while and we come away like this to, to decompress into that situation. How, uh, how does it make you feel having these rituals? Uh, it, it, help, it, it does give me that small compensation that we can't have to be 100% like a lifestyle that I would like, you know, he's on his knees for the minute he gets in and, you know, the fantasy stuff. Yeah. It makes me feel a little bit more balanced, so at least we have some small demonstrations mm -hmm. of a female led relationship in terms of the physical side mm -hmm. of it, rather than me making all the financial decisions and everything, which is part, all part and parcel. Having those small things help me feel a little bit more compensated that we can't have exactly what it is that we want to have. Where, uh, where would you say that you draw the line between what is fantasy and what is real? I think it's got to be, fantasy and reality is, it's got to be sustainable. So it's all well and good, so, like even with punishment, for example, because I've also punishment for every single thing <laughs> they've set with me throughout the day. You know, like, it, it's, it's, it's not sustainable for me to do that. You know, we have children, I can't just drop and, and punish him in front of children. I can't necessarily punish him for every single thing because he had the ass left. <laughs> so it, there are, I think for you to draw the line and to determine what is fantasy against what is reality in terms of female in a relationship is you have to look at what is sustainable for your, you know, for your whatever lifestyle you're living. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what can you keep up? What do, what does what feels natural to keep up rather than a pressure to constantly keep up? Do you think so, there is such thing as a pressure, or uh, how high is the pressure? I feel like I do feel like there is a pressure. For example, like if you are going to commit to things like um, like a punishment thing, it, it's like. A, so, for example, there may be one if you do if you're operating a, an FLR where you have a contract in place or a, an agreement in place where you have a, a punishment clause and you are agreeing that if they do something wrong, as long as you discuss it, you can punish them. So, like three or four things happen throughout the day, and you start making a list. But then at the end of the day, you still don't get that time, and then you get to the end of the week, and you've got four lists and then, or five lists inside. You then do all five lists, and it becomes a pressure. You understand? Mm -hmm. So I do feel like you need to find a balance of things that, you, that don't make you feel pressured right. into being a certain way, but actually let you relax and it feel natural. Right. Do you understand? Yeah. And there are plenty of ways you can work out punishments that aren't. Because I felt I thought well, punishment for me is hitting, 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 hitting. So it's working out. And sometimes necessarily that it's not always going to be about hitting. But there are other ways to mm -hmm. satiate your displeasure. You can communicate it verbally, obviously, but working out other ways that don't put so much pressure right. on me on our relationship. I don't feel like I'm performing to whatever agreement or contract we may have started off with. But again, all of that comes back down to communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. so, so communication is very important. Key, one yes. of the key. How it is for you to have Mistress Tess as your partner like that? How is it to live with Mistress Tess? <laughs> because probably a lot of them are questioning and dreaming. She's a lot of me in my pajamas. Fluffy <laughs> ones? Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, it's not all about the glamour. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very much about um, loving the woman that is not lying with the, the, the side of mm -hmm. if you will. Um, as she said earlier, so I think, uh, the, the, there's nothing artificial about what is seen by the, the world. As, as a man that has um, a life partner, a woman that is within this industry and has this job, and what would it be your advice for men out there that mm -hmm. are dreaming and wanting to have this? <laughs> you can come She's not like giving you an easy job, is she? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very important to know the perspective, the real um, perspective that is going on. Majority of them, or some of them, want this, wish this, are dreaming about it, but sometimes they are like, it happens, and sometimes it's not. Uh, but for those that really want to have a life partner, a dominatrix, 
Um, I think if they want to have a partner in a dominatrix that they have seen them online, that will never happen. Mm -hmm. um, what they see online doesn't exist. It is a fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, it's only two D version, isn't it? Yeah. yeah at best. Yeah, they, they they have to understand that it, it is a fantasy. They may well be able to incorporate elements of that fantasy yeah, into like their relationship. But saying what I project online is very authentic. But it's only a small part of it, isn't it? It's a very thin sliver. It's like if it was a big three D picture. It's the very front face of it, isn't it? It's what you. It's only what you choose to share, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You maximum 10 mm. or 20 percent mm. exactly so what would be your advice for for men that really want to have like they they think it is for them and they want this lifestyle from a man perspective a man that is living this lifestyle <sighs> <laughs> You don't that's have any advice. That's, that's yeah. what my, you don't have any advice. That's my conversation with Sarah. It's about it's about real discussions, real subjects, real topics, not just um, you know like. I think uh, because it fell upon you, didn't it? Rather than you looked for it, it's very difficult give, to give that advice. Yeah, exactly. But, but if you was one of those people, because I'm sure there were times when you you were serving other dominants in a lifestyle perspective. Prior to me, I'm sure there were times where you thought you hoped it would be something more than it was. Um, no. No, I no. <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I wish there was a uh, some, some words of wisdom that I could impart. Um, it's not about wisdom, it's about you sharing a bit of your knowledge from living, actually living this yeah. lifestyle. Uh, it, it is that realization that uh, the, the, the fantasy does not mm -hmm. exist. Um, she's more likely to be wearing a, a fluffy onesie than a latex catsuit. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's it is a fantasy, um, and uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like. To answer a little bit on his behalf, and one guy always say to me the same question: like, "What do I do? What do I do? What do I do?" You've got to look at why professional dominants are so successful, and, and they are successful. There's over two thousand of them in the UK, uh, in, in England alone. Sorry. So you know you've got to think that there is a reason for that. There is a severe shortage of women who are um, of this proclivity. Most of my friends are submissive, in, in female friends are submissive in nature. Uh, in their private lives, some of them are pro-doms, mm -hmm. and I feel like um, if you really were interested in this lifestyle, I think you just maybe got to invest yourself into, um, and be honest, in, in a vanilla dating scenario, if you're, even if you're dating in a vanilla pool, you still need to be honest, yeah. because there's no point getting into a six, eight dates in and swinging that you like it a certain way and trying to manipulate a woman a certain way. No woman ever, is ever going to know about this lifestyle because there are so many women that don't. And, and trust me, I run a party called Vanilla Corruption. I know there's a huge amount of women that don't even know this whole environment exists. Yeah. Is to educate women early on. If you're dating, be honest, speak about it because you're never going to get to live, even if it, it drives that one woman away, you've done it early and you've done it early on. So. The amount of people that come to me and they're like, oh, this was always in me, but I thought oh, maybe I could bring it up later on, but then it wasn't right, and then I didn't feel like it could, and then it was too late, and then I'm married, got kids, and now bam, I'm stuck here. And it's like, if you were just honest in the beginning, maybe she, if you'd educated her, she could have maybe fallen that way, but now you're at this point where, why is he suddenly coming up with this? So I think it's very important very early on, even if they're dating it inside of the vanilla dating pool, at least to be honest and educated. What's your advice for those that are interested in starting to practice BDSM or wanting to go professional? First for men, uh, for women, and then men. So for women, I do think it's very important to try and do the same route I did because I know there are more women open to that now, mm -hmm. which is a mentorship. Um, approaching a woman, being prepared to pay money to do it as well, or at least offer some exchange of services. 
there's so many women that contact me and they're like, even women who have been around the scene a little while now, you think that it's, I'm not saying I don't speak freely, you know, I give it plenty of advice, um, but there are some certain skills that I do feel like, I, no, you should now be compensating in some way. So I do think for women, try the mentorship route, particularly in 2020, 2024 now. There's so many women, particularly in the UK, that are popping up, you know, Viv, uh, Vivian Lamore, for one. I know uh, Dom Lassara, Milton Keynes, and they're just two of the people that, I mean, I've not got a lot of people on my radar, but two of the people I know on my immediate radar who offer a very intensive, very all-rounded mentoring program. So that would be my advice to women, to find somebody to mentor from. Somebody that also maybe can fit your image. It doesn't have to be exactly like your image, but somebody who maybe has a bit of an outlook, similar outlook to what you want to portray, you know, where you see yourself. And then for men, I'm not, I'm not entirely certain because I don't know about you, but when I got to start chatting to men about where, how they got into this, where they came from, majority are porn, majority. Some of them are like, it was always there, and then I just Googled foot fetish, or I Googled this, and then this came. He was shiny materials. You know, some people are just Googling words and then pronouns pop up. So I guess for men to seek out a professional dominatrix, it would be definitely to do your research, to make sure that you have mets, particularly in this day and age, that they have multiple platforms, that they have similar, um, that you read their website, make sure they have similar interests to you. And make and sure that the profiles that you're well, watching Oh, that's what I mean. One, multiple like, platforms yeah. of the same name, and the and, and half of those platforms will cross over somehow, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely do your research. 100%. What would you like your legacy to be? Oh, for doing things that not everybody does, and that is why I came up with the Vanilla Corruption, or one of the reasons why I like the Vanilla Corruption, because not many women do it, nobody else in the UK does it. And I know Princess Aurora does what she calls a bullying party, it's mainly verbal humiliation. It's not a let's educate and entertain Vanilla women, and then hopefully, and actually, just recently, I've had two women now from the Vanilla Corruptions who have gone off to do, start doing professional domination. So it has, <laughs> after eight years, finally worked. But um, it would be to do things that, that are out of the ordinary. Or be a bit a trailblazer, I guess. And that's a little bit like, I know I came home from going to the Order of Indomitus and seeing Michelle's event and wanting to do the same event here. But I have taken it back and made it my own and do things a bit differently. And I do feel like I'm the only one in here who's doing a similar event. Obviously, the OWK used to do a similar thing. Mm -hmm. They no longer do. It's a filming thing. And there are other, so I've heard of other certain events that are similar, but on a bit more of a lifestyle scale. Like I know Anno Nomis does mm -hmm. something in Portugal, but again, it's more service slave orientated. It's not really a, like a um, slave training mm -hmm. and slavery event. Um, so I, I want to I want to do different things, unusual things, things that not everybody is doing, because it can get to the point where, you know, oh I'm earning money and that's great and I want to feed my family and that's great and I want to do things and travel the world, lovely. But if you're really and, passionate, and that's, that's passionate about this in, in this scene, is to do something unique, mm -hmm. and that's what I want to do. I want to do, I want to be known for holding unique events or unique experiences. Do you remember your first interaction with BDSM? Oh, or how did you discover BDSM? Um, so you mean like in my private life or mm -hmm. you mean my professional career? Okay. Was it directly professional? No, 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 no. So I was doing things with boyfriends and husbands and things before, way before this, without even knowing that they were kinky. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I remember chasing um, my teenager's father around a hotel room when we were in Dominican Republic, trying to convince him to let me finger his ass. <laughs> <laughs> literally chasing him with a rubber glove on. No, I was literally, <laughs> honestly chasing him around the bedroom because he didn't want me to finger him. And I had a very, I had a fascination with anal for a really long time because, you know, you always get men asking you, and I'm thinking, well, look, you're doing it to me, I'm going to do it to you. So it became very early on, I think, for me to. Um, want to do to men and then using things in I remember looking around my bedroom 
to time into the bed, you're finding things like my just the drawstring for mm. my dressing gown and curtain the cur things that hold the curtains to tie up the end of the bed. So I've been doing things like that with boyfriends for a really long time before I even knew that this was stuff that you know was you know, BSM. Yeah. Do you remember your first session? Oh uh, yes, hundred <laughs> percent. What, 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 what was the um, So it was a guy who told me to online who was from the city I used to live in, the group I grew up in, and he had a, um, he'll probably see this because he still does contact me, uh, <laughs> he, um, he had it converted a, a, his garage at the end of his garden into a studio for his work, but also a, a playroom. Mm -hmm. So he literally had this, where you could flip it, it was his work, and then you could flip it right Wow. It was like, that's impressive. It was like, yeah. So, in a sense, really, from a safety point of view, I really did put myself at risk just driving to this guy's house and going mm -hmm. to his garage. <laughs> could have been like that was hard. Could have been Ted, Ted Bundy, for all I knew. But I think I felt reassured that I spoke to him a lot, a lot online, um, and he lived in my hometown. But anyway, looking back, obviously, <laughs> what advice new dons do that? But um, he wanted small penis humiliation, CBT, and whipping with a ruined orgasm. But to this day, had the tiniest dick I've ever seen. I mean, this heart. Was like this. I, I was like, so it was. What was that? I don't call that a big No, it's not. No, it was it was his, his testicles were large. Yes. <laughs> so I remember having him strung up, and I'm like whipping him, and then and so it was doxy till he was hard, whipping him to a soft, and I'm like, you're gonna have to tell me when it changes. This is so small, <laughs> I can't tell. tell. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to verbalise when he got soft. It was hilarious. So, and then, and then I remember um, taking him down and tying him up and putting a pick hood on him and writing all over him and mm. using, um, you know, those uh, toppers that take the top off a boiled egg on his, on his penis, but it being so, even with it closed, his penis wouldn't fit through the gap, like, <laughs> so I remember it very vividly and having a very great time and walking out of there feeling like, oh my God, I want to do that again. So, yeah, I remember that, that was September, nine years ago, yeah, in September, so, yeah. Time flies. Yeah, what's, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What is your favorite food? Oh, all of it. <laughs> uh, to cook or to eat? But uh, uh, oh. it's about knowing. Cook, so cook, cook Italian. Italian. Cook Italian. Mm -hmm. My mother always cooked. My mom, my mother is not cook. <laughs> that she's a very bad cook. So the only thing she could really cook a lot of when we were kids is pasta, lasagna, spaghetti bolognese. Um, Carbonara. So I definitely do cook a lot of Italian, um, a lot more authentically and a lot better than my mother. But um, yeah, Italian, but to eat French or Japanese. I uh, love sushi. Oh, I love sushi. Unfortunately, Seven doesn't eat any fish, so we don't have a lot of sushi, so it's a treat. Um, and French food. <laughs> <laughs> um, and French, definitely French food as well. What's your favorite love... perfume? Ooh. I'd say I one. Yeah, so there is one that I don't wear a lot of because I don't even know if they do it anymore. And I've got a bottle of brand new bottle of it still at home, which is a um, uh, Gavinci Hot Couture. I remember my uncle coming using the RAF, and he came home from base one time, having been somewhere abroad, and bought me a, a, like a little samples packet, and it had that in it, and I've loved it ever since then. Was the only, it was my first ever bottle of perfume. Um, and then, but now I wear more Tom Ford scents, so tobacco vanilla, ombre leather. Um, uh, I bought Seven Fucking Fabulous. All their stuff is like unisex, so I quite like that one as well. Yeah, but all the Tom Ford scents, my, well, most of the Tom Ford scents that I smell are fabulous. So, what is your favorite movie? My mind always goes to, and I don't know why, is Hook. Have you seen Hook? Mm -hmm. Dustin Hoffman. Pete oh, Pan. Yeah. 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 So I used to watch it a lot as a child, and even watch it now, I still like it. You know, I love Robin Williams, I love a comedian. I like rom coms and I like comedies. So um, Robin Williams is obviously a comedian that was in it. He played Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. And Dustin Hoffman is in a lot of comedies as well. And he was obviously Rain Man, and he's been in Meet the Fuckers and stuff so like that since. So, yeah, it's got two of my favourite actors in it, and my mind always goes. Even though I, I wouldn't, I would say it's about like. But every time somebody asks me that question, it always goes to Hook. I think it's it was a childhood favourite. Okay. So, yeah. What about music? 
what kind of music and if you have any favorite song Fresh or band. Fresh Bird is definitely one of my favorites. I've seen them live probably maybe seven eight times in the last decade. Um, and then on the same sort of, I guess, oh, similar sort of genres, Royal Blood, um, Mute. Um, but I have quite an eclectic music taste. Uh, anything, uh, I like anything and everything mostly, apart from a great deal of reggae. I can't stand it. I like a couple of Bob Marley songs. Other than that, I hate this genre. Just too, it's just the melody is not for me. And um, I also am not a huge fan of a lot of drum and bass. Mm -hmm. um, but I like classical music, I like electronic music, I like uh, rock music. I've got quite a wide taste. Whereas he is very narrow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I, I like a lot of different music. I like it because you bring the diversity. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Perfect man. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite city or country? Oh. That I've travelled to, or that I'd wow. like to travel to? Uh, Thailand. I've wow. been, yeah, why? Beautiful country, like, scenically beautiful, wonderful people, great, cheap food, um, and it's so vast. I feel like there's so many, I've been to so many places, I've, I'm very well travelled, um, but I feel like there's not many places I want to go back to. It's like there's so many places I want to go to. Why would I waste my time going to Where would you not return? Oh, uh, Cuba. Okay. Never again. I've been twice and I'm done. I would never do it again. Too poor, too um, run down. Uh, not, be beautiful in places, but just I feel like I've done it and I don't need to do it again. Um, I also well, like. I'll check. That yeah, the last time I went was only six months after the, hur the really bad <laughs> hurricane they had. They'd run out of food and there were so many buildings. It was just so sad to see. It was really quite run out, run down. And whilst Havana was full of culture, again, it really did highlight the poverty that they have there, considering obviously they're a communist state. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like oh, I just didn't, the, the, the vibe was not, it right. just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely would never travel back to Cuba. Um, and yeah, as well, I always felt like uh, Mauritius as well. I mean, when I went to Mauritius, I felt like that was oversold. Like, I saw the beautiful waterfall and it was very nice and the people were nice, but they didn't really like the climate too much. And I didn't feel, I felt like it wasn't as pretty as some other places I've been. It's, it's um, overrated. So, where would I like to go? Fiji, Barbados, Africa. So many, so many. So <laughs> the list is the large. Beach. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not, I'm, maybe 10 years, 15 years ago, yes, but now more a combination. I want to be able to relax, but I want to travel and see things. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to, I want to know, I want to get immersed in some of the culture, but I also want to know that I can have a relaxing time. For example, um, I went to Kuala Lumpur. Have you been to Kuala Lumpur? Mm -hmm. There's no relaxing in Kuala Lumpur, really. It's a very city break holiday. So you go to the temple, you see the monkeys, you go to shopping, you see the towers, you see the waterfalls, and then you're like, mm, okay, so, you know, for me, I didn't feel like it was a, a place that you had the combination that I would like. So if you try always to give me somewhere that's got elements of, and I don't mean, I mean, plenty, plenty I'm sure Kuala Lumpur had if you drove, you drove and drove. But I'm talking about, you know, going to somewhere where it's not too far to travel to get an option to relax, but then you can also see various different things mm -hmm. in the vicinity. So let's go back to our uh, field, our domain. Um, there is this misconception from my perspective, and I want to know your perspective. Um, vanilla outsiders often say that the ones that are practicing BDSM, the kinky people, are like this because either they have had, uh, well, Better say, they Trauma. have some issues uh, with uh, Trauma, you know, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. What's your perspective about it? I've been abused. I know, and I get this a question a lot at the beginning of corruption because the beginning is spent where we bring the guys in and I make them do an introduction, and that consists of the name, their age, mm -hmm. how long they've been into Fendom, where they discovered Fendom, and why they think they like what they like. Mm -hmm. And, and and then they get to hear a range of things as to so it normalizes for the dealers that it's, I'm not saying there aren't a huge amount of people that there are. I've met guys who, who have had traumatic experiences 
and will attribute them wanting to come for BDSM because it is a way of them taking back the power from a traumatic experience. For example, they've been at war mm -hmm. and they've seen frontline experience where there's been a lot of violence that's been out of their control. So now they would come for a consensual, what they consider a consensual, for want of a better phrase, violent mm -hmm. exchange. Um, so that's a, and that's a power take back. And but there isn't there is that is only a, a portion of people. That's a, it's a bit like saying um, anything really, isn't it? It's a bit like people saying people like going to the gym, there are people that like pain, or it's only people that like pain. Some people do like the pain the gym brings. People like the results. People like to go to their, their health. Mm -hmm. People like to go for aesthetics. There's so many different reasons why people get people people enter a gym, and it's no different with BDSM. There is, a, there is, without a doubt, a portion of people that do do this because of trauma-based experience. But, no, but, but not, it's not all-encompassing. No, it's like I said to you, I've touched on earlier about um, um, some guys I spoke to about um, how they feel like it's always been there. They can't explain it. They don't know how what it was. And it wasn't until something caught their eye, like Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman or a shiny looking uh, piece of material in a catalogue or their babysitter put their feet on them and then they googled foot fetish when they became right. a teenager. So there are a huge portion of people where this is naturally built into the men. It's not come from trauma, it's not come from porn, it's come from naturally being part of their personality. How do you think that people should look towards BDSM? How should, I'm talking about the vanilla ones, the, the, the outsiders. Yeah. So you mean how should they view it? Mm -hmm. Again, I feel like it should be viewed like any other any other sexual preference. Like, but the problem is, well, even with even with vanilla sex, there is still there's, there's still discrimination. I always vanilla. say there is all you're always going to get DS relationships everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And. It, I think you're always going to get discrimination. It's sex, sex always brings discrimination, regardless of whether it's BDSM or DS, whatever. Because look at how much just ordinary porn has gone through and does continue to go through. So um, I feel like you're always going to get a level of discrimination, but I feel like it should always be viewed as, like anything in life, it, it, it's their if it's within their consensual boundaries, they should be able to choose what they want to do. I will say, I'm not, I'm not religious at all, and I would go as far as saying I'm probably an atheist. I'm, a, I, I'm very spiritual, and I agree that there may be something else behind uh, this life that we live in, but I don't believe in the whole God stuff. But um, pagans live by an ethos, harm none and do as you will, which means if it doesn't hurt anyone else, why wouldn't you let everybody live the life that they want to live? themselves. And I suppose people could argue, oh, well, BDSM is hurting people, but that's a consensual exchange of experience. What it means is you're not hurting, yeah. harming anyone outside of that environment. So if it doesn't harm you looking in, why would you make judgment? Wow, this is amazing, just said, and I think this is where to have it as a conclusion mm -hmm. of all this interview. Mm -hmm. um, Think about that, this is like food for thought, yes. you know, everyone that is, is watching. Um, so, be you know, more pagan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, choose, if you want to be pagan, be pagan. <laughs> use this philosophy, use yeah. this mindset, and you'll see that things will change, not only within you, but also in your environment, in your interaction with, with people, and in your life in, in general. Mm. Love, I want to thank you very oh, much. You are very welcome. Pleasure. We can talk all night. <laughs> I want to do is have a conversation. There's always something to say, yeah. It does not an issue. Um, I want to, um, to ask, where can people find you? Oh, okay. So, I'm on, I do have my own YouTube channel, but it's more focused to my babies. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the YouTube channel? Uh, I think it's just Mistress. Tess, isn't it? Is it Mr. Tess UK? Yeah, just search. Just search for Mr. Tess UK, yeah. So it's, it's more unboxing my babies, talking about my babies. Um, and then, um, but I'm also on Instagram, FetLife, Twitter. Um, I don't I think, oh, loyal fans. What's your official website? Uh, mistress-tess.co.uk. 
Okay, so if you want to get to know more, you have everything that you need. <laughs> Thank you, love. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Much. Um, and for you, don't forget to comment, share, and subscribe to my to my channel. Thank you for watching this episode, and see you next time with more and interesting subjects. <laughs> Bye.